lies about me again. <laughs> you are with a tie and everything for the webinar? <laughs> yeah. Well, Carlos, you need a haircut. <laughs> yeah. But it's a COVID. It's a COVID. We don't have any, <laughs> anything open now. Yeah. You've got to put up your COVID hair on, you know, like I'm going to be very impressed. <laughs> I will, definitely. <laughs> I think I have it here, and let's see. Uh, okay. You have appointments today, Kit? Yeah, I actually have twenty. This is the first day. I mean, it not not busy. I had like 12 patients, so not very much, you know, we spaced That's them right. out, but uh, it's the first day that we've had more than about three patients in the last two months. So it's, uh, it, it was slowly starting to, to open up again, very slowly. All right, so I have it here. Kit, so I will present you like always. You are <laughs> from the house here already. You should just press a button and then just, <laughs> 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 Everyone knows you now, but you need to know uh, Cusco, Kita, the next time, please. Yeah. It's, the first, uh, it's the first place that you have to go, huh? In Peru. Cusco. Yeah, of course, Machu Picchu. Well, well, I went to Cusco, but I only spent like one day there. You know, it wasn't long enough. It's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> it was a very, it was fantastic though. It really was fantastic. Yeah, that's true. Bueno, 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 buenos días a todos. Eh, espero que estén eh, muy bien en sus casas, como siempre les digo. Y tenemos el honor de presentar nuevamente al doctor Kit Barton, que yo le decía que prácticamente es de la casa, porque siempre está con nosotros. Eh, nos ha acompañado también a muchos congresos en Lima. El último en Paracas. I think you remember that uh, meeting in Paracas that was really good. Bueno, el doctor Barton es un oftalmólogo de staff y especialista en glaucoma en el Hospital de Murfield. Es lector honorario del eh, UCL Institute de Oftalmología, co-chair de Ophthalmology Future Forums, editor y jefe del British Journal of Ophthalmology. Él tiene mucho interés en el manejo quirúrgico de glaucoma, como van a ver ahora, que este caso es súper, súper difícil. Y se interesa mucho en dispositivos quirúrgicos y glaucoma secundarios, específicamente en glaucoma uveítico, que lo invitamos hace poco a esa charla también. Él fue el único doctor eh, fuera de Norteamérica, también en participar en este estudio grande, que todos lo conocen, que es Tubo versus Trave, que es el TBT Study, y también co-share del AMET versus Verbelt. Es miembro del comité también del Treatment Advanced Glaucoma y Lasers in Glaucoma y también del Ocular Hypertension Study. Well, Dr. Barton, uh, I hope you enjoy also to be with us like these days. Uh, please, welcome. Thank you, Juan Carlos, as ever. I never know what you're saying, but it always sounds good. <laughs> it's something good. It's always good. Don't worry. <laughs> this is why I do this, just to listen to you say these great... <laughs> tell all these lies. <laughs> now, well, I, don't know, I don't know what he said, but, but kind of what I specialized in early on was the stuff that I guess nobody else wanted to do. And it was Roger Hitchens who really got me interested in cyclodialysis clefts. I didn't even know what one looked like. And I remember the first patient, he said, oh, this patient's got a cleft, go in and stitch it up. And I said, no, 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 no. Yeah, we'll go in and stitch it up together. I'm not going by myself. But this is a 15-year-old boy from Athens who um, was referred to me in 2011. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Dr. But we cannot see your presentation. Okay, okay, right. So let me, I forgot to share the screen. So, <laughs> uh, which wasn't very good. Ah, and I send your article to everyone about oh. the, <laughs> yes. They so will comment was, that. Yeah, yeah. No, there wasn't anything. That's the first slide, really. This 15-year-old boy from Athens was referred in 2011 with three months history of reduced vision and hypotony in the right eye after motorcycle accident. I don't know what he was doing in the motorcycle or what happened, but he, 
and he was diagnosed having a deep cyclodialysis cleft. He had three courses of argon laser cyclopexy with no improvement. He then had cryotherapy, which gave him inflammation. And he then came with low pressure and uh, choroidal folds. And they said, well, what are you going to do? So on examination, his visual acuity was 660, correcting to 624. The other eye was 64. His right pressure was 4 compared to 15 in the other eye. I had quite bad macular folds with a right shallow anterior chamber and a difficult, very difficult fungus view. And this is what it looked like. So this is the, um, I think that that's the right eye. That's the normal eye. Just for comparison, you can see the chamber in the, the, this eye is deeper. And uh, you'll see when I go back again that the, the, the first eye is really quite soft. You, even when you're touching the eyelid, the cornea is indenting, the chamber is shallow. And it is really a very soft eye. And he said no surgery. Simply this was a blood trauma. On gonioscopy, as is very typical of cyclodialysis clefts, you can see nothing because in a soft eye with uh, gonioscopy, the anterior chamber is just shallow when the angle's closed. And that's also a problem. People report um, good results with imaging, but to be honest, if you've got a cyclodialysis cleft, it can be very difficult to see with imaging because again, when the eye is soft, everything closes up. But what I tend to do is inject some viscoelastic elastic at the slit lamp. And that, that's what I saw after the viscoelastic and the slit lamp. Very, very different. So what is slit lamp viscoelastic injection opens up the drainage angle, stretches it wide open, and then suddenly you see everything. And not only do you see everything, you can see this huge cleft separated by several septa, but down here, there's actually another little cleft as well. And this is important because if you close the big one, if you close this big one and miss the little one, you still have hypotony because it only takes a tiny cleft to get hypotony. So you've got to close all of this and you've got to diagnose all of them, which again is why I like to see them in direct visualization rather than, uh, rather than just with imaging alone. Because with imaging alone, you might miss that little one down there in this big area of angle recession here. So that was pretty impressive cleft, and most of them that you will see will never be that large. But that's a little extra bit that, that's important to, not to miss, or, or you still end up hypotony. But it directs cyclopexy, and I didn't video that operation, but uh, basically, if you understand this, uh, th this is the eyeball. There's some traction sutures to pull the eye, um, the eye uh, temporally, and he has basically actually three large areas of cleft, um, over pretty much four clock hours. That's the medial rectus. Um, and what I do was I take the conjunctiva and tenons and pull it right back with traction sutures. I make quite a big spiral flap all the way around so that I can get direct access and see every single part of the cleft. Um, so that's a conjunctival incision. You've got the traction sutures and tenons. You've got traction sutures in the cornea. And you've got a big scleral flap. And then you've, you've got the clefts there, which I close with 8 nylon or 9 nylon. It needs to be quite, you can't close clefts with thin sutures because afterwards, if the pressure goes up, the wound will rupture. So you need to use quite um, tight, quite strong sutures, 8 or 9 -0. Postoperatively, this guy was actually very lucky because on day five, his pressure was between 19 and 20. And on day 14, the pressure was 22. And this is unusual because if you don't quite close them properly, they can be hypotenuse for two or three or four weeks afterwards. And if you do close them properly, the pressure can be 100 afterwards. So to end up with this very smooth postoperative course is not 100% typical. So this is, um, this is postoperatively. You can see there's quite a lot of sutures still there. You can end up with a slightly eccentric pupil if you're suturing a very big cleft back together, simply because it's very hard to reoppose the, the, uh, the, the tissues accurately. But on gonioscopy, you can see I, I, he's still got some angle recession. If it's a smaller cleft, it's easier to get the iris back to where it started, but uh, he's still got quite a big bit of angle recession, but the cleft seems to be physically shut because the pressure is 14 on no medications. Visual acuity is up to 612, which is a very impressive. 
but he is developing a cataract. And cataract surgery, and that this was, um, sorry, this was uh, three months. At three months, this is what it looked like. <clears throat> so he's been quite lucky. The problem now will be the cataract because that area of cleft, although stitched tight, is still potentially weak. You can see it there. And if you do cataract surgery with a high flow of, uh, of uh, BSS, you could blow the cleft open again. You know, there is a risk. So you've got to delay the cataract surgery for a while until everything's healed. And that's the gonioscopy at three months. You see that little area, you know, there's some little areas that you might think still have a cleft, but the pressure's 14, then there's no functioning cleft. So blunt trauma, um, I've stolen this uh, picture from an old textbook. What blunt trauma does is when you hit the eyeball straight on, um, you create two shock waves. One goes transmitted through the cornea, and that tends to push they th push things outwards. In other words, it tends to pull uh, the sclera, displace the sclera outwards. The other shock wave goes backwards through the aqueous and pushes the tissues in the eye backwards. So the, the forces to separate the tissues are um, downwards, backwards from the aqueous and uh, like that, and laterally away outwards from the sclera. So you can see how um, the various sphincters and um, circular tissues can get damaged. You can get iris sphincter ruptures because the iris gets su suddenly uh, ruptured. Uh, you can get um, erudodialysis or you can get uh, angle recession. If you get an iris sphincter rupture from tearing the iris sphincter, the pupil sphincter, uh, angle recession from tearing the ciliary muscle, um, aerodialysis if the iris just pulls away, um, or psychodialysis where the actual ciliary body pulls away completely and the ciliary body is no longer attached to, from, to scleral spur and then aqueous can go straight into the supercoidal space, absorb quickly and the pressure goes down. And here's a, here's a more typical cleft, this is quite a small one uh, and this is more often what you will see and this is behind an area of PAS. You can see again there's been a big area of angle recession but that part's torn and you can see there's a direct communication into the supercoidal space. <clears throat> Before you close these, obviously you can try conservative methods. I would warn you that most clefts close by themselves. So when you read case reports of laser and everything working, very often, these are clefts that would have got better by themselves anyway, because 99% of clefts heal spontaneously. The problem is the ones that I get are, are the ones that never got better, and a few months down the line, the patient still got hypotony. And in order to close those, you've got to be able to see exactly where the cleft is, you've got to see exactly how long it is, and you've got to see exactly how many there are, because you've got to uh, close them all. Now, this was an interesting paper from Korea in 2008 in Archives of Ophthalmology, and they, they reported very, very good results with imaging. I have to say that it's very hard with imaging to know exactly where the cleft is. And in fact, at more fields, if you sent patients uh, with hypotony for, for an op to the ultrasound department and asked if there was a cleft, the answer always came back, yes, whether or not there was a cleft. You know, it's very easy to think there's a cleft on, on uh, UVM or an OCT when there isn't. It's very easy to find a cleft when there is one, but it's very, very hard to know the limits and exactly where it is. Um, especially when the eye is soft and shallow. Like uh, you see here, this, this chamber is also fairly shallow. That's another, uh, another case. So this is a left eye. And you can see the, the, the chamber depth in this case is more dramatic uh, compared with uh, the, the previous case. You can see this chap's got a very, very shallow chamber. You can imagine that you can't see, can't see anything in gonioscopy. Um, and even with non-contact non imaging, the angle is going to be closed. So you're not going to easily see the cleft. So it's very hard to suture it. Viscoelastic opens the angle and allows good visualization. You can see here, um, 
you can see here where the cleft is. So it is possible to see, we can see here that there's no separation, but it can be very hard to get the limits and to, to miss and to spot uh, small clefts. And here's without viscoelastic. And here's with viscoelastic, as you can tell from all the bubbles, but you can see this isn't as dramatic as the previous guy, which is very dramatic, but it's still fairly sizable. There's one, two, three areas of cleft there that you might miss without the viscoelastic, or you might miss an imaging. So if you want a definitive diagnosis, injecting a small amount of provisc at the slit lamp uh, gives you it. And you can see how, I mean, that this, you would think that this was impossible to miss, yet without the viscoelastic, we couldn't see it. Aerodialysis is an important differential. In general, people who get aerodialysis don't get clefts because of the iris tears, then the ciliary body doesn't separate because the iris tearing decompresses the shock wave. So there is a, a generalization that if you've got an aerodialysis, you don't get a cleft. But on the other hand, um, that's not 100% true. And here's one. Um, this is a large aerodialysis patient from years ago. Um, and you can see just there, there's a very, very tiny cleft at the end of it. And again, if you relied on imaging alone, you would see this enormous aerodialysis, but you might never be able to spot this tiny cleft. And that's what's causing the hypotony, just that little crevice right there. And as I mentioned, um, at Moorfields, routine imaging results in overdiagnosis of clefts. We yeah. find clefts yeah. that are not there. Um, surgical management requires precise localization and accurate visualization, as well as identification. And here's another one that's quite small. Again, they tend to be in areas of angle recession uh, rather than aerodialysis. And again, without the viscoelastic, you, you might not see that. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, doctor. Okay. Yeah, I, just in case I'm talking to myself. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <see> <laughs> it's clear, clear. <laughs> So there's two ways, you know, okay, there, there's lots of ways, you know, I'm, I'm joking here, you know, I don't use laser Botox, Inco, capture tension rings, vitrectomy, gas, oil, herbal tea, or rejuvenation creams. You know, in general, these people have bad hypotony maculopathy, and, I, and usually when they get to me, they need to be fixed. So I've got two ways of fixing them. One's uh, cryotherapy and the other is surgery. Uh, there are many su reported successful conservative treatments, but there are no real good studies of these. That's the problem. And remember that 99% of clefts get better by themselves, which explains much of the success. <clears throat> the clefts I'm dealing with are usually more than six weeks after injury and are definitely not going to heal by themselves. Hence, um, and I tend to wait that long. So this is cryopexy. And... Part of the problem now with cryopexy is a lot of units don't have it anymore, um, but it is useful for clefts. It's very hard to do gonioscopy and cryo at the same time, but basically you've got to get the cryo over the cleft and you've got to do a freeze thaw three times and get a decent ice ball. And when you're doing cryotherapy, what you've got to do is let the cryo off very slowly at the end, because if you, um, if you bring it off too quickly, the cleft opens again. So what, what the cryo does is it sticks the cleft shut. Um, you know, it freezes the cleft, causes opposition of the tissues, and, and which, which is, which is, oops. Causes opposition of the tissues and closes the cleft. You can see that there's a little cleft there. It's very small, yeah, um, yeah. But, but you can see it's definitely there. And you cryo that, I mean, that, you don't need to suture that, you can cryo it. You might be able to get away with laser if you can create enough inflammation, 
But the cryo pushes the sclera against the clear. So it's like indentation, you're actually closing it. And then when it freezes, it sticks shut. And if you take the cryo off gently, then you hope it'll stay stuck. If you take it off too quickly, it unsticks again. As I say, part of the trick is, this is like rubbing your stomach and patting your head at the same time, you know, with two hands. It's quite tricky to get the gonioscope to see where the cleft is and get the cryotherapy on. Because once you've got, a, if you've got a decent sized gonioscope like the Magnaview, you cannot get space for the cryotherapy probe. So it can be tricky. But this does work and it's very good for small clefts. It's not really so good for big clefts, but you're really using, the, why, why is cryo better than laser? Simply because with laser, you don't push in. With cryo, you do, and, and cryo obviously creates a lot more inflammation than laser. And the cleft needs to be small enough for the probe to create complete opposition. And you need to maintain the opposition after the probe defrosts so that you don't pull it off again. Cryopex, on the other hand, this is a very old video, but basically, you take the cell flap right into the supracroidal space and you stitch the, the, you stitch the ciliary body or the cord back onto the sclera. It's really, at its most simplest level, that's what you're doing. I mean, you open up here, you cut upwards away from sclera and you should get a gush of aqueous because there'll be fluid in the supracoidal space. And it's useful to have a paracentesis first, put viscoelastic in the eye first, because when you do open up here, remember, this is the same as opening the anterior chamber, the, the eye will go soft. It requires good access in the correct location, the whole length of the cleft for all the clefts that are present. And you can see here, this is a big cleft, so you need a big flap. And you can see the difference between the iris and the ciliary body and the different color. And part of the problem of getting these back together again is actually the, um, is actually the, the extent of it and the bulge. I usually make a full thickness flap about three millimeters deep and wide enough to, to see everything. The biggest mistake is having the flap slightly too short and missing the end of the cleft. So that's why you make a big flap even for a small cleft, because you don't want to miss part of the cleft or you don't want to miss a tiny little cleft beside it. You then take eight or nine O nylon, not 10 O, because if, they, if, this, if the pressure goes very high, it'll burst open again with 10 O. And you go through ciliary body bands. Sometimes ciliary body bands really define tissue. Sometimes it looks like you're just suturing choroid. And you basically put in a couple of mattress sutures and you, you put them, you get the tension just right. And then what happens when you look, what I'm looking here is I find actually there's another little bit of cleft there that I missed. So I've got to go in and stitch there as well. And that's what I'm saying about sometimes the flap isn't wide enough. So, you, so it's always better to make a wider flap than you think you need. And then afterwards, you stitch the whole thing together. But th this video, and you can see it looks like barbed wire. It looks like some kind of cruel torture. Now, that video was taken more than 20 years ago. And the, the, but you can see still the result is good. It's just less elegant. We do it slightly differently these days, and I'll come on to that. Um, this was a, what I showed you earlier. And occasionally, you see something interesting like this is the long ciliary nerve. I've never seen this so dramatically demonstrated as in this case, uh, usually the ciliary body band here and the long ciliary nerve just aren't visible like this. <clears throat> and sometimes the cleft is very small, but the tissue next to it is very weak. And as soon as you try and suture the cleft, the, the rest opens up as well. So in some cases, the, uh, the, these, the tissue's been damaged by the trauma, and although it's hanging on, it's only just hanging on. You can see that this one's got a, a little bit in between, but, but the, there are bits here that are very weak roundabout. And you can see, this case is good, there's quite obvious ciliary body band. 
Sometimes it just looks like choroid that you have to suture, which is a little uh, frightening. Why use big ugly sutures? <clears throat> the reason you use big ugly sutures is if the IOP goes high afterwards, the wound will explode. And it's really as bad as that. And you don't, you, you don't want, and this is a patient from 25 years ago, one of the first patients I did. And we, I used 10 on nylon. I think this is the one I did with Roger Hitchens. And I used 10 on nylon. Pressure went to 50, wound just opened up again. <clears throat> a year later, I saw another one just like this from a colleague in another hospital. Exactly the same happened. So ever since I've used eight or nine on uh, nylon, so that was my first cleft repair in September 1998, so 22 years ago. If the pressure spikes afterwards, 10 on nylon is just not enough. So the question is, how can you avoid big ugly sutures looking like bag barbed wire afterwards? You know, we're, we're in the days with, uh, with Ike doing eye stents and uh, everything sutureless, and, and th this looks like something out of a, you know, this looks so like something out of a, a Second World War concentration camp. You know, this is terrible. Um, well, what you can do is you can make a double flap. Here I'm making a little frill around the back so I can bury the sutures. <clears throat> that allows you to bury the peripheral sutures. If the sclera is thick enough, you can actually make a double flap and bury the, the central sutures as well, the ones on the actual uh, cleft. And that way, that way you've got, uh, you can hide the sutures so it's not so, not so disgusting and ugly afterwards. Um, and this is just entering the anterior, not, the, not entering the anterior chamber, entering the suprachordal space uh, on, underneath the, the frill. You need reasonably thick sclera to be able to make a decent frill. And then you win gently, always with a blade upwards so you don't cut choroid. Usually there's fluid so the, the fluid separates you from choroid. And then you suture the ciliary body band, if, there, if it is, or sometimes it just looks like choroid. <clears throat> Remember that because the eye is open, if, if this bleeds, you will not get another suprachoidal, you will not get a suprachoidal hemorrhage. Having said that, you know, most of us in our lifetimes will only stitch five or six of these. I've never, I've never stitched hundreds of them. You know, I, I, I've done, uh, in 25 years, I've done, 40, 40 something. Um, but uh, it's, that's because I've taken a special interest in doing them. So m most of us won't, will see very few, but in that 40, I've never had a significant bleed afterwards of any sort. And what you do is you gently oppose. You've got to try and get it anatomically back to the right place. <clears throat> and so otherwise you can end up with a peak in the pupil. And you see that one's half closed, then I can do another suture. This one where well, there's a great big bulge, and it's actually quite, uh, it's actually quite uh, tricky with, it, with this big bulge to get it all back in the right place. You've got to get the iris back in the eye. So obviously you can use myocol and pilocarpine. <clears throat> um, I've never actually used an iridectomy in this situation, but you could do. And then you very gently start trying to get the anatomy back to where it should be. Uh, after it's closed, uh, and in this situation, sometimes you can get the, uh, these scleral sutures right onto the frill. Sometimes you can make a double flap and you get it all nicely reopposed uh, without the sutures being exposed on the outside. I must say, I must point out that if you're doing one like this in this situation, you're really much better, safer under general anesthesia because you have a very wide open eye. And if the patient had a high vitreous pressure, you really could uh, be at risk of an expulsive hemorrhage. Although I'd say I've never seen one in the 41, 42 cases I've done. And you very slowly close this and, and reoppose it. And you can see now uh, I'm pressurizing the eye. <clears throat> the choroid's still bulging because of the pressure in the eye, but, but the iris is no longer bulging. And hopefully you can see underneath, you can see that the uh, iris has been, the, the cleft has been reopposed. 
What I'm doing down here is there is a tiny leak of aqueous down there. So I'm wondering, do I need another stitch down here? And it, it's a difficult call when to stop because you can put a lot of stitches in. And obviously, um, the more stitches, the more trauma to the ciliary body band. But I, I think at this point, I decided that the eye was firm enough and I didn't put another stitch in. So there, this time, no ugly sutures. You can see I had to extend the flap. It wasn't big enough to start with. But you can see the sutures are all buried underneath it. Now, the nice thing is that you can actually, uh, given that, the, under, given that this, the bottom flap underneath has been sutured closed, you can, you can glue down the frill afterwards so there's no sutures left on the surface. So this is tissue tissue glue, gluing down the, uh, gluing down the surface. Uh, remember that the big sutures are in the flap underneath. So this way, this, this is a really just a, a more modern version of the same technique. And uh, gluing it down, you can see now there's no big ugly sutures on the surface. And uh, it's a much uh, more aesthetically pleasing result. You can see the pupil small because of myocol or palocarpi. There is a little bit of a peak in the pupil. With a very big cleft, it's very hard to skillfully um, uh, oppose the anatomy to avoid a pupil peak com completely. Um, that's so something that's a cause of frustration. Here's some more glue. So the flaps, the superficial frill has been glued down, and now the, uh, the, the deeper, now the conjunctive antenons get glued. So this time, no ugly sutures on the surface, looks much nicer, and you get the same of, uh, effective result. And that's just getting rid of some of the glue, the excessive glue. It's interesting that blood-stained glue looks remarkably like conjunctiva. Sometimes it can be hard to differentiate the, the glue from the conjunctiva when the glue gets blood in it. Um, that's just a manual Simcoe IA taking out the viscoelastic. Uh, now, it's all, another difficult call is, do you take out the viscoelastic or leave it in? And the answer is usually that you take out certainly some of it. If you're going to leave some in, don't leave a lot in because the pressure can go very, very high. On the other hand, if you're worried that there might still be some leakage um, while you're waiting for that to heal, the eye may be a hypotenuse for a day or two. <clears throat> so um, that, that's a, pretty much my technique for cyclodialysis cleft repair. Uh, we've done a couple of articles, as Juan Carlos mentioned. There's a, a, a review article some years ago that, that I did uh, with Alex Ionides, who was uh, one of my fellows at the time, and a, an evaluation we did. This evaluation was just a, a bunch of about, uh, I think it was about 20 cases, and we, we found that with larger clefts in general, surgery was better than cryotherapy, although it wasn't by any stage a randomized trial. We also recently done a multi-centered trial with ICAMID, um, Again, just looking at various techniques, but unfortunately, because nobody has a lot of cases, as I say, uh, almost specializing in this technique in, in, in 22 years, I think I've done 41, 42 clefts. That's about two a year at the most. Um, so takeaway on messages, most clefts recover with medical therapy and don't need anything. Cryotherapy is better for small clefts if they're persistent. And cryopexy surgery for large clefts, again, at the persistence. There are many reports of less invasive laser techniques. These may be beneficial in the early stage um, if you've got bad hypotomy and you, you need something doing. But uh, beware that most clefts heal spontaneously. And the ones I'm describing are the ones that have been persistent. And that's... Uh, that's pretty much all I have to say in clefts. And there, there, is, there is a cleft video I've been putting together. There, there is one that we presented in AAO some years ago on YouTube, but it's a fairly old fashioned one and doesn't show most of those modern videos. I'll be I'm revitalizing that at the minute and it'll go up in the next couple of weeks. And thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks, Keith, again. Thank you very much for, for your amazing videos. That looks really, really good. And I was looking for that video, actually, for the, the AAO. And I was trying to, to click in that video, but it did not work. Hello? I lost you. Can you hear me? Have we lost Juan Carlos? Oh yeah, my connection is really, really bad. <laughs> yeah. You're saying was there a problem with the video? Yeah, with the AAO, the, the one that you mentioned before. The AAO video, well, we, we did that, oh God, we did that 15 years ago with the AAO. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I ago. <laughs> Is it not, it's, I, on, it's on YouTube, does it not working? Yeah, I, I saw your video actually in 2006. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. it that, that one's very out of date. It needs, I mean, the technique, you know, the technique's roughly the same. It's just a bit, we just managed to tweak it, make it a bit more elegant now. Because the, but it, the fundamental, the basics are the same. It's just the, 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 the high, high definition videos are better and the, uh, you know, burying the sutures onto the flap and things makes the operation much, uh, much less brutal looking. It's much, much, looks much less like a torture operation. <laughs> <laughs> so Keith, uh, how much time do you wait to do the surgery? The problem is most, most of the ones I get have, have been waiting two or three months already by the time they get. To, I even saw one guy, I, I, I've seen guys, you know, two or three years coming and saying, well, they just told me nothing could be done. You know, and nobody did anything because they, they said, well, we can't do anything. So I suppose the take home message is something can always be done. Um, if, if you're, if you've got very bad hypotony after two weeks, you really should be doing something. Uh -huh. And it's not unreasonable to try some laser or something, but if you've got a big cleft, like some of those ones I've, I showed, if, if it's that big, it's never gonna go away and laser's never gonna fix it. So then you should be thinking about surgery early. Mm -hmm. So in hours of the clock, uh, how do you super, uh, separate cryotherapy with the surgery? Most cryotherapy, I tend to do if they're small, like half a clock hour, one clock hour. I qu quite uh -huh. a lot of them are that size, you know. Um, I, I seem to specialize in the big ones, you know. I've got quite a, the, the big ones are always more fun to show in the videos. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes. Yeah, but not, but not fun in the moment, I think. Well, exactly, but most of the ones you actually see in real life are actually much smaller. And you, and you could, you know, cryotherapy is an easy way. Um, the only thing that's hard is, you know, getting the gonioscope and the cryo at the same time and, and, and you, you yeah. turn it on. But cryo is, it's obviously more invasive than laser, but it's not very invasive. And you've got a, you've got a better chance of, work, of it working with cryo than you do with laser. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some question here about uh, how much time do you wait to do a cataract surgery after uh, you do a cyclodialysis uh, repair? I, you know, I, I've seen a patient, you know, who had cataract surgery years later and it blew open a cleft. You know, you, you, you just got to... I, my attitude is if, if the patient needs the cataract, you've got to do it, but you're certainly going to wait at least six months or a year, probably at least. Mm -hmm. usually, usually that's not the problem. I mean, that, that young boy at 15 years old is going to get a cataract, but he's not going to be looking for surgery, you know, immediately afterwards. They, they just want to get better for a while. So I, I would say wait a year. Um, but then you got to do it and just pray it doesn't open again. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Mirel, yes. there's other question that you want to yeah, do? So they ask, doctor, about your parameters and what lens do you use to do the, um, to the, do the repair with laser? I never do them with laser because when they come to me, they're usually beyond laser. Um, uh, okay. 
So I, so I basically, the lens I would use, you know, if I was lasering them, I would, I would do the magna view um, because it really gives a, it's kind of the best view of the angle. Um, I would be, if I was doing it, to be honest, if I was doing anything with laser, I'd be tempted to do diode laser, CPC of it rather than argon or rather than SLT. I mean, SLT is going to do nothing. So are you going to do argon? Maybe. Um, probably diode will give you more reaction. And the advantage of diode with the G probe is you can indent and maybe get some closure. I've never done this, but if I was lasering, that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. And I saw also that uh, in your article that they have like a blunt uh, trauma or ocular trauma and they are okay, but after uh, FACO, they yeah. have the, the cleft, right? Yeah, yeah, we've seen, we've seen the occasional patient who had, you know, trauma, God, 20 years ago or something. I can't remember who the, the patient in that article was, but there was one. But uh, maybe it was, I think it was six, something makes me think it was six years later. I can't quite remember. But yeah, something you, like that. Yeah. You have to assume that probably the ciliary body was just holding on and no more. And then the, the fluid movement from phaco just pulled off that little, you know. So the ciliary body was much weaker than normal, but there was no actual cleft. And then the, mm -hmm. the, the pressure, the fluid, the fluid from the phaco just uh, separated it. That, that's what we assume. And I saw also that you were uh, putting in, in your article the peaks of hypertension that you have after you close the cleft. So how the, can you manage that? Oh, yeah. I, I remember the first time I did the cleft. Um, I remember I was paying call, was operating the next theater. I said, paying, you know, I just closed the cleft. He said, he looked at me and said, the pressure will be 100 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, it, I think it might have been 70. <laughs> and that's the problem, you know, in that article, that BJO article, I think, I, I haven't read, the, the, we wrote this article, although we published it 10 years ago, we wrote it about 14 years ago. It took us a long time to finish it and submit it. And I, I think we had something like 40 or 50% pressure spikes. The trouble is, while I say, you know, the pressure might be high the next day. The problem is it usually isn't. You know, often the next day, the pressure is seven or eight. And then the patient comes two weeks later and the pressure is 40 uh, as it closes. The, the point is that when it closes and the pressure goes up, it usually comes down again. Very few of them actually need glaucoma surgery later. Most of them, you just give them Diamox and lots of drops and pray, <clears throat> you know, there's diamox, lots of drops, pray, and the pressure just settles. Because the reason mm -hmm. the pressure goes up is that the trabecular meshwork, they never had glaucoma. The trabecular meshwork has been doing nothing for several months, and it needs to wake up again. And so the pressure goes through the roof, you put them all on the medication, it comes down again. All, some of them need glaucoma surgery, but not very many. Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw like you have like only a uh, low percentage uh, yeah. to do like cyclophoto coagulation and also a, a drainage device in yeah, one yeah. patient, I think. Very, yeah, very few need anything. And it's, it's always been like that. Even, you know, since then, I, I think I say I think we had 20 or 21 in that series. And since then, I've done about another 20 or 21. And it's exactly the same. We rarely have to do trap or tube or anything afterwards. Mm -hmm. And how much do you wait for that case to do like a, a surgery, a glaucoma surgery, after you repair that cleft? Mm -hmm. Or how much do, do you wait usually? When, when the pressure goes very high, it usually comes down again. It, it, it's then later on, if you can't get them off the medication, that's when you think about doing surgery. So you're usually waiting quite a long time. In other words, the... Uh, you know, after two weeks, the pressure was 40 or 50. You put on a lot of medications, it comes down to 20 or 18. And remember, these people don't have glaucoma, and they're generally young. So although they've had bad trauma, a lot of their trabecular mesh work's actually okay. 
Um, so you get them down, the pressure down, and then you slowly try and take them off the medication. And then, and then, you, uh, and, and then uh, at that point, if they really can't come off the medication or they're getting disc damage or something, then you think about surgery. But as I, as I mentioned before, it's, it's rare that we actually operated on anybody for glaucoma. Perfect. Miren, ¿tienes otra preguntita? Yeah. Dr. Mohammed says, if you ever seen a case of an annular cleft, like 360 degrees or something? No, never. Oh, never. But I did see one guy. So there's, there was this guy uh, I saw, oh, 20 years ago from Zimbabwe. He was a white guy in Zimbabwe. And he got, he got beaten up, basically, by, by a mob. And when you, when you met the guy, you would understand why the mob might have beaten him up. But anyway, that, that doesn't matter. <laughs> this guy was kind of an argumentative guy. Anyway, he had probably about six clock hours of cleft. That's probably the biggest I ever saw, which meant that I then had to open the eye through seven or eight clock hours to get all the way around it. So then you think, well, is he going to get onto your segment ischemia? Well, he, he didn't, you know. But then again, that was 20 years ago when I'd never seen him since. Um, but he, he had a lot of cleft. You know, the iris, the, when you looked at the iris, he had aerodynesis because the, the iris was attached to the ciliary body, but the ciliary body was almost not attached to the sclera. But I, nev I never saw, well, that, that was the most I saw. It was like five or six clock hours. It was really, really wide. And it took me two goes to fix it. Uh -huh. Yeah, also your last case was very huge. You opened like uh, the conch, like a uh, retina surgery there. Um, it was, well, it was big. I, 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 got, I got a worse one than that. You know, I, selecting the videos, I've got one where basically there was a, a cleft at 12 o'clock and a cleft at nine o'clock. So I had to do two big flaps, both quite big. So the patient ended up with two big flaps on the same eye. Um, again, they, haven't, they didn't manage to get the... Uh, uh, anterior segment ischemia would have been okay. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of my colleagues will say, you don't need to open up like this. You can do it, you know, you can do a partial, you can do like a deep sclerectomy flap and put stitches through it. But and others have said, you know, use tap capture tension rings and you suture them in. But it's very hard to close these precisely, um, especially the big ones. Doctor, uh, how much or how do you deal with hemorrhage during surgery? Is never, it frequently? Touch, I've never had one that's really caused a big problem. Interestingly, I, it's always been right from the start of the back of my mind. You know, it, it, these could bleed, it could be a big deal, but, but they never seem to. It's interesting, you know, I, you, you're putting stitches through the outer choroid and it doesn't seem to bleed. Okay. Um, and, and now, having said that, I probably the next one I do will bleed. You know. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I, hope so. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doctor Mura has a comment. No, he's he's driving now, but oh, okay. he he told me that he he made that revision together also. With Juan Mura. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I think most of the questions have been solved. Yeah. yeah so maybe maybe to to put something clear, cryo if is less than one hour. Yeah. Surgery, of course, more than one hour. You put like nylon eight O. Mm -hmm. For you, is the better option, no? Certainly, I don't like it all because it is big and ugly, but it works. So sometimes I do, more often I do 9 these days, but never use 10 -0. It's not strong enough. Okay. Uh-huh. But cyclodialysis is awful. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's an awful case. It's interesting, no? it's interesting to do. It's real, real surgery. You want surgical horrors on Friday, so I got, so these, are, these are surgical horrors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think we we solve everything now, Miriam. I think. 
<laughs> Excellent. I don't, I don't think I've got anything left. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, okay. Dr. Mura so, asked if patients will have a lot of pain at this at the next day. Now shows uh -huh. usually, usually don't only if the pressure is very high. Mm -hmm. This is not like mm -hmm. you know when we're talking about choroidal hemorrhage on Friday. Yeah. Um, Choroidal hemorrhages are unbelievably painful. I, I should have mentioned that. And that's how you, that's how you diagnose. The patient walks in the door. You don't need a B scan or an ultrasound to diagnose choroidal hemorrhage. The patient walks in the door in agony. You know they've got a choroidal hemorrhage. You know, it, it, they're so painful. These patients, the, the eye's a bit painful, a bit sensitive, you know, it, for sure, but it's nothing like choroidal hemorrhage. Okay. Well. Perfect. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. It was an amazing, an amazing presentation. Thank you very much, Keith. I hope you can come to Lima after this pandemic. <laughs> I'll be delighted. Uh, you've got to go on. Uh, but I've got, there's so many more restaurants we haven't been to. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot. They open more. <laughs> I, need, I need to go to Costco for more than one day. Totally. At least a week. At least a week, Keith. We really. Stayed, we, we stayed in the monasterio, and uh, yeah. I, 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 I don't think we spent more than about five hours in the hotel. You know, which was such, no. such, such a nice hotel. Yeah, it's very nice actually. Yeah. Okay. All care. right. Thank you very much, doctor. Gracias a todos por conectarse. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much for participating again. Thank you. My pleasure. Really. My pleasure. And be safe, of course. <laughs> Mañana no se pierda nuestra segunda charla de la semana. Tenemos al doctor Lincoln Freitas con cirugía de catarata en pacientes con glaucoma. Todos los tips Hoy. que nos va a dar el doctor van a estar increíbles. Así que no se lo pierdan. En Portuñol, Mirel. En Parece Portuñol, que va a ser en Portuñol. Como, como a todos les gusta, Portuñol. Sí, pues, eh, hay, que hacer una, hay que hacer la pregunta esto de mañana, temprano, ¿no? ¿Qué prefieren? Vamos a hacer la votación. ¿no? Yo creo que Portuñol, Portuñol es la nueva moda. Sí, la tendencia. Que sea la próxima semana también vamos a tener una charla. Estén pendientes de nuestras redes sociales, Facebook, Instagram y eh, YouTube para ver las charlas pasadas, para que no se pierdan las, las próximas. Gracias a todos. Gracias, doctor Juan Carlos. Gracias, Mireille. Nos vemos Nos mañana. Vemos. Chao. Chao.